Wow, I love it. All right, uh, less than a minute. I'm Larry White. I'm a professor of economics at the Stern School. I'm your moderator for the panel number two, uh, which is on mergers, which Paul Romer told us, piece of cake, that's the direction to go. Let's find out more. Um, what the format is going to be, uh, we ha all have to be conscious of the fact that we're the folks that are between you and lunch. Uh, and so the format will be as follows. Uh, I'm going to offer very brief introductions of our five speakers. You've got their longer bios in the program. Then I've told each of them they have five minutes for an opening statement. And I'm a tough guy. I'm prepared to limit them at five. Uh, you may be able to help me out if you notice they're going a bit more than five. You know, start doing this sort of thing. We take all the help we can. Then uh, I will toss a few softball questions uh, out to the panel. I hope, of course, we'll get brief answers back, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. And again, I'm hoping we get Qs that are brief uh, and As that aren't brief as well. So let me quickly uh, give you brief bios of our five speakers, just alphabetical order. Uh, Judge Walker is a cuss, as am I. Uh, alphabetical order, we're always at the end of the line. Sorry, <laughs> Judge Walker. Um, all right, so please, uh, Bengston is head of the uh, unit for the chief economist team at uh, DG Competition at the European Commission. He's worked for the European Commission since 2002 in different capacities, most recently as head of cabinet for Commissioner uh, Margaret Vestager. He has previously worked for uh, the Commissioner for Trade, Carol de Gucht, and uh, Commissioner for Competition, Neely Crows. Held several different positions at DG Comp. Uh, Debbie Feinstein is a global head of the antitrust practice at Arnold and Porter from 2013 to 2017. She served as the head of the Bureau of Competition at the FTC. She is, you know, we clearly have a number of alums from the commission, just as we have alums from the uh, Department of Justice, and so she's an alum of the commission. Uh, John Newman is currently an associate professor at the University of Miami School of Law, fellow with the Thurman Arnold Project at Yale, a member of the advisory board of the American Antitrust Institute. Prior to joining academia, he practiced with the US Department of Justice. Another alum. Sharis uh, Posen is currently the co-chair of Clifford Chance's global antitrust team. Uh, prior to joining Clifford Chance, she spent five years as GE's vice president uh, and global head of antitrust. Um, she's been a practice leader at two US based law firms, Hogan and Skadden, and served at both the Federal Trade Commission and the <coughs> DOJ, and led the DOJ as acting Assistant Attorney General. And Judge Walker, last but not least, uh, served as a US District Court Judge from 1990 to 2011 before joining the bench. He was a partner in a major national law firm, a member of the California Law Revision Commission, and law clerk to a federal judge. He now conducts a mediation arbitration practice and serves on the investment committee of an international litigation funding group. So there we have it. Ladies and gentlemen, five minutes. Thank you know, Clay's start it out. <coughs> thanks a lot and, uh, and thanks a lot for the invitation and I already enjoyed this morning uh, tremendously so it can only go downhill from here I think. <laughs> um, my boss is, uh, is the Executive Vice President of the European Commission. Uh, she has a, a part of her remit to, to deal with uh, antitrust enforcement in Europe, but she is also the Executive Vice President for making sure that Europe is fit for the digital age. Uh, and that's a reflection of the fact that I think we have ahead of us uh, five years where they will in Europe be focused on two uh, major issues. One of them is uh, uh, the, the, the green agenda, 
and the other one is uh, the digital agenda. So this conference really fits straight into uh, to one of the, the main priorities of the European Commission. Um, and what will happen in uh, merger control and the enforcement of, of merger control will, of course, remain uh, independent and as a, as a uh, legal uh, exercise, just as it has always been. But I think in order to understand where we are headed on the, on the broader agenda, I think it's important also to, uh, to understand that this digital uh, transformation, we consider it as a societal uh, transformation that deals with our democracy, that we deal with our privacy, and that also deals with uh, making sure that markets uh, are open. And so our merger enforcement, if you think about where it has been and where it is going, I think you have to think it into this, uh, this, this broader um, uh, context. Now, if you think of where we have, uh, if you think of our past practice and see where, where we have been in the last uh, five years, it's not that there is a lot of uh, enforcement in the digital uh, uh, sector that is particularly informative or that I would want to highlight as uh, particular uh, indicative of, of where we, we could, could expect to see the challenges uh, ahead of us. We had in the last uh, five years an enforcement record that was roughly at par with historical levels. We had one uh, uh, prohibition case that attracted uh, quite a lot of attention, which was uh, the prohibition of the uh, merger between Siemens and Alstom, two <coughs> European uh, incumbent uh, champions. And that has still provoked a little bit of, of debate still, also among our member states, how our competition enforcement aligns with the ambition to create uh, champions in this uh, field or the other. So alongside the debate that we have about whether our uh, tools are fit for the digital age, there is also this uh, uh, agenda about whether we, are, um, whether we need to uh, look at our tool in terms of uh, industrial policy. I think the first strand is the one I would keep my eye on because I think that's the one that's going to be by far the most important and the most interesting of those two uh, strands uh, uh, going forward. Um, when I say we don't have that many interesting cases in, uh, in our merger enforcement, I think what I can say about our cases is that most of them has been cleared. There have been very, very few remedies. Almost all of them are, are characterized with this uh, combination of uh, assets from different markets uh, rather than very dramatic horizontal uh, cases, <coughs> cases, which I think also reflect well uh, the kind of business models we are seeing in the digital sectors. We do see people acquiring things uh, that complement what they have themselves and that put a challenge on, on us as enforcers to make sure that we, we get the analysis right of when is, uh, is that exceptionally uh, a bad idea rather than having us the presumption that it's a, a, a good idea. If I had to pick two things that I think will uh, increase in focus uh, going forward, I think one of them is something that we already saw in the last five years, which was an increased focus on the effects of, on innovation. We had a couple of cases where we approached uh, the process of innovation and the competition for innovation uh, much more uh, directly and explicitly than we have done in the, in the past. I would expect us to do uh, more about that, uh, not only in the digital uh, area, but also in the digital area, because of course, if uh, the acquisitions by the, uh, the incumbents are, are done with a view to make sure that, uh, that innovation is not rewarded with uh, new potential entrants, then we will definitely look, uh, uh, look out for that. And the other one is that the historical maxim of following the money will be complemented by a maxim of following the data. Um, I think we have in many of these markets uh, not been good enough at looking at the effects of data, but clearly that is a, an area of, uh, of increased focus um, and that is, in a way, what very often links the different activities together from different markets, uh, even when they are not uh, defined as separate uh, relevant markets in, an, uh, in a standard competition sense, then we will try to be more uh, 
focused on understanding <coughs> data as a payment, data as an input, uh, and data as a source of, uh, of market power. We have backed this up with uh, a, a report we have uh, received recently from uh, a number of experts, um, and, uh, and work on this will go forward. Great. Great. All right. Debbie? Uh, sure. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just a couple of things I think that are important when we're talking about the terminology. You know, first, what do we mean by killer acquisitions? They can mean two, at least you know, two different things that I can think of. One is when you're actually acquiring a company or a product to kill that, basically just eliminate it. Um, it's a pesky little nuisance to you. That's, that's one thing. Another sometimes, though, is people talk about killer acquisitions is when you take a nascent company and you combine it with, or nascent product, and you combine it with a larger company. Uh, and then the question is what happens um, with it. And the two sort of counter examples I use are when the FTC brought the QuestCore case, uh, it acquired rights from a company uh, uh, that had rights to develop uh, the only competing product uh, to what QuestCore uh, had. And the evidence suggested that had the QuestCore not acquired it, it was going to be acquired by um, another company who was going to develop it as a significant competitor. And the evidence suggested that QuestCore wasn't really going to do anything much with this product. That's one kind of killer acquisition. The other thing I've heard of described as a killer acquisition, again, I never worked on this, I don't know the facts, um, I know what I read, so uh, I don't want to be read as saying too much about it, but um, Facebook Instagram is one that folks often talk about as a, a killer acquisition. Uh, but in fact, Instagram is alive and well, and that's exactly the concern people have. But there's a real question uh, about what Instagram would have looked like but for the merger. And I think you have to think about those kinds of transactions very differently. Differently, So I, I urge that people think carefully about when they're using the phrase killer acquisition, what exactly they mean. Second is when talking about innovation, I think it's also important to think differently about innovation for a very specific product. When two companies are clearly developing to come up with a generic product for X, we know exactly what we're talking about there. Um, we can think about what it is or just general innovation, innovation to find a cure for cancer, innovation to come up with a new solution to something else. The law and facts and economics for that are very, very different. Uh, I think it's different to say we know, um, we have good empirical evidence that when two generic firms merge, if they're the only two companies with a generic product uh, that compete, that are about to compete with a branded product, prices will be different than if there's one generic product competing against that brand. There's lots of empirical analysis about that. I don't think we know that when there are two companies doing just sort of general innovation in a space, that competition rather than collaboration is better. There's a lot more work that we need to do uh, to decide that, and we're always in the business of making predictions, but the example I often use um, it's a case I worked on many years ago, is Genzyme um, acquiring Novozyme. For 50 years, um, folks knew of a disease called Pompe disease, terrible disease that um, uh, people are born with, and uh, the infants usually don't um, live through childhood. The two companies had been trying to develop this product. It hadn't even been tested yet uh, in a human being. The CEO of the target company, Novozyme, had two children with the disease. And he went out and looked at the, the situation and said, you know what, I, I formed this company, but by itself, it's not getting there. I really think we need to get the best minds in the world together to basically try to come up with a remedy uh, for this terrible <clears throat> disease. Do we really think that CEO was selling to another company to try to make more money and eliminate competition? He really believed that this was going to find a cure. The combined company did, in fi fact, find a cure. Um, President Trump had his, the daughter of the CEO uh, who was alive in a wheelchair but alive and in college at one of the State of the Unions to talk about how you know, it was important to have you know, regulatory, it was, a, it was an FDA issue that he was speaking to, but the notion is that sometimes collaboration is better than competition for innovation and I think that we don't know enough about early stage innovation to say that competition is always better and thinking about uh, efficiencies is um, always really Im important. Um, the third thing I think it's important to do sort of backwards retrospectives on um, 
transactions that uh, either were cleared or, or more importantly were blocked. Um, oftentimes we hear um, uh, the one that I um, um, tweak folks about is the, uh, there was a gene therapy case many years ago, 20 years ago, uh, at the FTC. And at the time, um, the press release from the commission said that blocking the merger, I think it was between SIBA and Sandoz, was about saving lives. Well, it took a lot of years before gene therapy uh, was ever successful. And query, I have no idea whether or not if people had been able to work together, uh, they would have been able to develop something more quickly or, or not. But certainly, uh, it wasn't the case that competition in that case led to very quick uh, results. I, I just think you have to be careful when you're thinking about all of these things, because this is not like um, concentration where we pretty much have good economics and good law that suggests that if you're going from three competitors to two, probably that's going to be a problem. We don't know that going from seven competitors to six in general innovation is likely to be harmful or beneficial. We don't even know it for three to twos or even sometimes for two to ones. Great, thank you. John? Well, thank you to the uh, organizers for the opportunity to speak. Um, I was sitting here thinking about this, and I know there are a lot of litigators out in the room. And if you, you know if you have uh, you know, five arguments to make, and one of them is really weak, what do you do with it? You just put it right in the middle, right? So nobody will notice. <laughs> and if you'll note, that's kind of spatially what's happening up here. Uh, but with that, uh, I, I would like to maybe build on some things that have been said in the, in the previous panel. And to suggest that, that high technology or digital markets is, is, is kind of a hard thing to sort of classify with any kind of rigor. You know, what is a digital market? What's not a digital market? That's kind of a blurred line, and I think it's probably getting blurrier with each passing day. That said, though, I think digital markets, sort of loosely defined, um, in particular merger policy in digital markets, could be a fruitful uh, area, and I would argue even the best area, to start advancing uh, antitrust law more broadly. So the reason I say that is, is that at a high level, I think you can point to unique sources of, of market power, unique ways to acquire, uh, maintain, and exercise market power in digital markets. And I think you can point to a unique sort of lack of offsetting efficiencies when it comes to horizontal mergers in many digital markets. Now, merger law is no picnic for plaintiffs, but I think it is the maybe most friendly area to begin if you want to start developing antitrust law more broadly. So with that as a framing um, device, a couple of areas where we might want to think about advancing or developing antitrust law more broadly using digital merger policy as a, as a springboard. The first is market definition. Uh, I tend to think we should start getting away from formal market definition, in particular the SNP variant, as a requirement in cases. Right? Uh, it can be useful, I think, in some cases, but it has become a kind of de facto, and sometimes even de jure, it seems, requirement. Um, it's never, I don't think, been a, a sort of particularly great sort of universal idea, and it's had this unfortunate tendency to spread into conduct cases where I think it really makes very little sense at all. It's very problematic in zero price markets, of course, where users produce things called attention and data that they trade in order to get access to platforms. Well, without a price, it's really hard to run a SNP test. Um, and it often really doesn't seem to add much, if anything. So I was struck when I took a look at the DOJ's recent um, Saber Fair Logics complaint. When you're reading through that complaint, the idea of a SNP and market definition in general just doesn't add much at all to the core of DOJ's case, which seems to be all about just direct evidence of competition and a likely loss of competition. Uh, second, theories of harm. I think you could use merger policy to develop unique theories of harm that could maybe then migrate to conduct cases. I'm thinking here particularly of cases like Zillow Trulia, where you had a horizontal merger to monopoly, uh, if you listen to the own CEO's statements about market shares post-deal. Um, and, and what Zillow Trulia did post-merger was to steer their users to favored realtors <coughs> in an effort to accelerate <coughs> concentration <coughs> in local realtor markets. Right? So this is a really interesting kind of steering harm in related markets, the kinds of things we often talk about when we talk about Google, for instance. Uh, but maybe you could develop it in the fr relatively friendly confines of a merger case and then use it uh, in other cases afterwards. Um, and, then, and then also on the, on the idea of theories of harm, you know, you could look at something like Facebook, Instagram, and you have statements from Sheryl Sandberg post-deal where she said, after we acquired Instagram, 
we could then target users across platforms and deliver the same ad to them now that they couldn't escape by switching away, and her words, not mine, we could then drive them all the way down the funnel. Now, that's, a, that's a unique theory of harm that I think could fit within antitrust law, but might need to be developed in a horizontal merger case. Uh, and then finally, efficiencies. I think in general, we've probably to some extent overestimated efficiencies from horizontal mergers. Um, and I think horizontal mergers in digital markets are probably particularly likely not to produce the kinds of efficiencies that the merger guidelines talk about as being you know, good and, and generally cognizable. And that is shifting production among facilities that were formerly owned separately. Like that's talked about in the guidelines as the one really good type of efficiency. Well, in a horizontal merger case involving digital platforms, you're not shifting production among facilities uh, post-deal. Instead, when cases do get filed, it seems like parties either immediately abandon the deal, as happened with FanDuel, DraftKings, um, or just raise really just garbage, like hilariously bad efficiencies claims like we saw in the H&R Block case or the Bizarre Voice case, suggesting to me that maybe there is some uh, you know, uh, room to educate courts about the lack of likelihood of positive efficiencies here. So again, I think these are just a few areas in which antitrust challenges to horizontal mergers um, in digital markets could be used as a vehicle to develop the law more broadly. Great. Oh boy. Sure. Sure. Um, wow. So wow. <laughs> just for a little disclosure on the front, from Larry's part, we, we each got five minutes, but we didn't really coordinate very well. I, I colluded a bit, uh, collaborated a bit with Debbie, but so otherwise. So <laughs> bear with me here because I do want to take a, you know what's been said, particularly by, by Debbie and by John, and, and put it into a little bit of a context because I would suggest there's been some experimentation on what to do about killer acquisitions over time. And I want to sort of take that and say where we are today. Maybe that I'm kind of going backwards a little bit, John, from what, what you said. Because I think what we saw, again, we've been doing this for 30 years, full disclosure, we, we saw actual and potential competition theories uh, promoted. Uh, and you know we saw some failures there in terms of the cases and some resistance to that. Um, and, and I'm talking sort of pre-2010, um, and particularly at the FTC, because they, they said they, they were skeptical of these theories, and they came up with a burden of proof requiring clear, and, uh, clear proof of future entry um, as a standard. So that, I'm taking us back in time a little bit. So then we saw a little bit of a shiv shifting and pivoting to looking at innovation markets and R&D markets. And then we saw the 2010 guidelines, which you mentioned. And I think we saw the 2010 guidelines trying to suggest a little bit more about nascent competition, killer acquisitions, as they're called today, and, and provide some, some more guidance, that, and especially to look at how the agencies were thinking about these issues. So to quote the horizontal merger guidelines from 2010, it, the concern seemed to be when one of the merging parties has a strong incumbency position and the other merging firm threatens to disrupt market conditions with new technology or a business model. So that was codified in the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines. So then, and we do have an expert on the panel, then we saw, again, some further experimentation in the Steris, Steris cycle. Uh, Synergy Health, sorry, Steris Synergy Health Matter, where they were looking at a market where there were two companies uh, merging, right? And the question was whether or not Synergy was going to be a potential intern into the marketplace. And we saw the court reject that. So again, exper experimentation that's been ongoing for some time. We next saw the CDK acquisition of Automate. Again, that was an acquisition of a small uh, market share, and Debbie was talking about some of those acquisitions. And again, I think that was under your watch, not, not your watch, okay, <laughs> Debbie's saying no. But again, another FTC case where we saw experimentation. Then we saw the recent Illumina uh, uh, acquisition of PacBio. Again, another big incumbent buying a small percentage. We saw that deal abandoned. Not to be outdone, we saw the Justice Department's Saber Fair Logic matter that you were looking at. I think as we get into the two-sided market discussion a little bit further, that's an interesting one because the DOJ did not plead that as a two-sided market. We had the Second Circuit come down with an opinion related to Saber, alleging that it was a two-sided market. And so um, I, I think we've we've seen it. We'll see what the court does with that. And most recently, we saw the Edgewell. Harry's shaving merger um, also abandoned. And again, it was not the largest incumbent, Gillette, but Edgewell owning Schick, trying to buy Harry's, a, a, a new entrant into the market, and that being abandoned. I think there's ongoing litigation over the merger agreement there. So, so what do we take from that? I think that um, it's typically you know, a dominant firm buying a small firm that we've seen so far. 
Um, I think that we've seen the, the movement uh, uh, towards looking at disruptive technology and what that means. We've seen the courts come out in different places on that. So again, in the US, we are faced with courts who are coming out in different places. Um, and, and I think we've seen a, a move a step further in the Edgewell-Harry's merger because again, the HHIs there, if we're gonna use those as standards, were relatively small in terms of the changes. Um, and then finally, I would say we haven't necessarily seen, other than the Steris case, where someone was a, a real potential um, competitor, that the courts or the agencies going after someone who isn't actually a participant in the market or is in an adjacent market and what impact that would have. So I think that's a stay tuned. We'll see what happens there. When Eleanor Fox kindly wrote to invite me to participate in this uh, event, she didn't say why she had written to me, but I inferred from the title of the program that it was because I was the judge in the Oracle PeopleSoft case in about uh, 2004, 2005. That, of course, goes back a long way. And uh, as a result of the invitation and thinking about that case, and I will tell you, of course, as a federal district judge who, in the course of 21 years on the bench, has heard thousands of cases, there aren't too many that stick out in one's memory. But the Oracle PeopleSoft case uh, certainly does. And I didn't do a deep dive into the case, certainly didn't uh, do much reading about it, but thought a little bit about it on the plane coming here and was impressed, it seems to me, by the comments that we've heard from John and from Debbie, and we heard this morning from Dan Rubenfeld and from Bill Kavasik about the importance of integrating all of the evidence in these cases. The merger guidelines we have, we've got the Brown Shoe case, we've got Philadelphia National Bank, we've got notions of undue concentration and so forth. We've got econometric studies which are presented. Those have some import and value in deciding the case if you're a generalist judge. But what really strikes home is the more qualitative evidence that comes to bear. In the Oracle PeopleSoft case, it was the evidence of these, what the government thought were fringe players in the market. What the government tried to establish in that case was that there was a separate market in what it called high function human relations management software and financial management software. High function. Well, there was a lot of lesser function software that was present in the market that served medium-sized businesses and governments and was nibbling away at the edges of the market and the government never really had a clear explanation of how you could distinguish uh, those competitors and why those competitors didn't offer a competitive threat to uh, Oracle and a merged Oracle and PeopleSoft. And then the other point, of course, which came out clearly there and has come out, I think, in the years since, is technology doesn't stand still. In 2000 four or five, whenever that case was tried, nobody was thinking about uh, all of this software essentially on the cloud. And what we have, of course, is the emergence of uh, some big players who have uh, essentially based competing software on the cloud. And of course, Google and Microsoft have also nibbled around the edges. But in terms of the real impact, I think, and competitive impact on the merged Oracle PeopleSoft, it has come from companies like Salesforce. And I can tell you, although it's not admissible evidence in terms of market share, if you live in San Francisco, you know full well that the traffic and hubbub associated with the Salesforce conventions is just as great as the hubbub associated with, or with the Oracle open world. <laughs> Now, as I say, that's not admissible market share evidence, but it <laughs> certainly is something that impresses you if you live in the Bay Area. So the more qualitative evidence that um, can be presented, I think, proves to be very um, impressive to a generalist judge. And I was really struck by Bill Kavasik's comment that Judge Jackson was seeking some kind of a focus group 
when he talked to all of those uh, reporters in the Microsoft case. That it's a pretty lonely task to be assigned a case like the Microsoft case or the Oracle PeopleSoft case, where you are deciding something that affects thousands of people's livelihood, that uh, affects commerce substantially, and what gives you a sense of doing the right thing is less the numbers and much more the human dimension that can be presented. That should not be overlooked in, uh, in presenting these cases, nor should it be overlooked in thinking about the field generally, because ultimately, as has come out in some of our discussion, and certainly came out in Paul Romer's comments, this field is affected not just by what happens in court or what happens in regulatory agencies. There's also the political dimension and what is necessary to present a compelling case in court also has a um, has an echo through the political processes and government processes that are involved. All right, great, thank you. And, and I really, you know, positive feedback, I really believe in. Thank you all for keeping uh, within your time a lot. All right, so uh, I said I would start with a couple of softball questions. We will get to the um, more general Q&A. Uh, Andy Gavel brought this up uh, earlier today, this issue of the series of small mergers that may not even trip the Hart Scott Rodino uh, uh, filing requirements, but cumulatively over time in the uh, general uh, sort of uh, conventional wisdom is you look at those big five and you look at their history over the last decade or so, and they've merged with dozens, if not multi-dozens, uh, of small enterprises. How, what's the best way? Can antitrust uh, deal with something that incrementally doesn't seem to matter, but you wake up a decade later and, oh, there's a problem. Anybody have any ideas about how to deal with this uh, incremental issue? Place, you're you're looking expected. So why don't we start? <laughs> uh, no, I think it's a it's a it's a great question. I remember from my philosophy class in uh, at at university, I was asked how many uh, grains of sand do you need before you have a heap. Um, <laughs> okay. And when you came up with a econometrically well estimated number, you probably realized that you could take a grain of sal salt sand off, and you still had a heap. Uh, and so it was quite difficult to exactly delineate when uh, when the heap ended or not. Um, we have in our merger rules uh, a system to take into account if you have multiple transactions between the same two parties so that you cannot escape the merger thresholds by carving up the, the acquisition in, in smaller uh, bytes and, and ship it off uh, sequentially. But we don't have anything to deal with the fact that you might have many, many small acquisitions that when they combine uh, produce a big effect within the merger rules. But we do have an interesting precedent in the pharmaceutical uh, sector where um, we found an abuse of a, of a dominant uh, position where part of the package of conduct that we uh, held against the company was uh, acquisitions that uh, that were meant to, to take out uh, competitors from the market that had not been reviewed under the, under the merger rules. So th there might be avenues uh, within uh, the merger system uh, where you can think of ways to, to accumulate it. I don't think that is, at least from our vantage point, is not in the pipeline. Uh, but you might also think of ways to get around this uh, through some of the other uh, antitrust tools. Sure, a couple of, of reactions. First is, you know, what is the problem that you woke up and found? Is it a conglomerate problem, which is not really what our antitrust laws are about? Uh, and, um, uh, you know, question whether or not that is something that the antitrust laws um, should, should be about because just because there are a number of companies under one umbrella doesn't mean that that's necessarily a problem or that consumers uh, are harmed. Um, second, there's nothing about Section 7 that doesn't allow you to do that. You just have to show that the transaction is likely 
to harm competition. And I'll use the Instagram example again because I've heard people at the FTC talk about this. At the time Instagram was hired by um, Facebook, how many employees did it have? 15. Yeah, 11. I think it was 11. Fewer than the number of people sitting at some of the tables that I'm looking at. Second, I saw an article about um, I, probably only two years ago in the New York Times um, by somebody, one of the founders of Instagram, who was one of the 11, who said, oh my God, what Facebook has done with Instagram is never what we imagined that Instagram was going to be. It was never supposed to be a large platform. It was always supposed to be this quaint, cute little place. So the but-for world of Instagram, would it have looked like the Instagram of today? doesn't sound like it based on that. Again, I don't know the evidence. I've heard FTC people who were there at the time say there was nothing in the record that suggested that Instagram was going to be this big competitor to Facebook. And maybe it's only a big platform because Facebook made it one. So you have to figure out what was likely to happen. And it's really hard um, to make those predictions. And then the final thing is if the company is, in fact, a monopolist in taking actions to harm competition, Section 2 does cover that as well. So there are ways um, to go after it. You just have to ask yourself, what exactly is the problem uh, that's been caused? Was it foreseeable at the time? Um, and what is it that is now harming competition? And what is it that we can do to address it? I do think there are, there are tools, but the facts matter as to whether or not um, you can um, say with confidence that blocking the merger would have led to uh, an outcome that af actually benefits competition. Anybody else? Yeah, can, can I just sure. add to that? I think that to Debbie's point about Instagram, I think the compounding factor was WhatsApp, right? You, you had Instagram in isolation that maybe didn't make um, you know, an enormous difference at the time, to your point exactly, Debbie. And then I think you combine it with WhatsApp, with the millions of users of WhatsApp, and, and, and then you did start to see a platform that has, I've had seen estimates between four and 10 billion users globally. And, and so is it, is it users that we should be concerned about? Should, should there have been some foresight to see, you know, one step of Instagram, maybe not so much, two steps of adding WhatsApp in there, oh my God, you've got now the biggest telecommunications platform in the globe and one that once everything is nested in can be used for who knows what purposes. So. I will say that I, there is a cumulative effect. I think in the agencies, they do rely on third parties complaining and raising these issues and, and being sure that they listen to those at the time. And then they do have the ability under Section 7 to go back and look at them or under Section 2. I would agree with Debbie. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I really, really uh, appreciated Debbie's comment. That we need, it's hard to talk about this at just an abstract level, right? Because every, every market that we talk about today is going to be a little different. Um, but maybe drawing on Bill's, Bill's early idea of like appetite for risk, I guess I would just suggest that we could approach this type of conduct without undue concern about the risk of spinning off business units, right? First off, firms spin off business units all the time. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We just generally assume that the market will kind of you know, fix any mistakes. And it does seem like there's almost kind of a double standard here where people say, ah, we really don't want too much merger enforcement because that will uh, stifle the market's ability to function. We're also really worried about spinning off business units because we're, I guess, um, worried that the market won't be able to fix that problem. Uh, and I would also just suggest that, you know, the agencies are already in the business of overseeing and sometimes even orchestrating spinoffs. They do it in the merger conduct, uh, context when they require divestitures. And honestly, if I can be a little bit proactive, um, since it's getting close to lunch, we want to keep everybody interested. Yeah, I have a lot more faith that an Instagram spinoff would survive and maybe even thrive uh, than I do, honestly, that Dish is going to launch a really effective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are lots of interested parties in the room here on that one. All right, let, let me let me pick up uh, on the so one theme of the last few comments: the issue when you've got uh, antitrust case merger good example, where there's a zero price being charged to what appears to be the major customer. Uh, how, how is merger analysis going to be able to deal with the zero price phenomenon? Anybody? Is, is it really a zero price? Well, okay. Because uh, there is obviously a good 
a good deal of money that goes into providing that service. And you can price that service by the cost that it uh, costs to produce the service and measure it in that capacity and look for what it earns on the other side of the market. Uh, it seems to me that uh, a zero price uh, product should be analyzed as much as you can, just like any other product. Would that, all right, you, you were on the bench when a uh, number of these, uh, they didn't come before your court, but you know, eight, 10 years ago, would it have been possible for a district court judge to have used the language you just used? Uh, arguably, let me play devil's advocate, he or she yeah. would have said, huh, hey, customers aren't getting charged a price? You're telling me there's going to be an adverse competition uh, effect here? Well, skepticism. I, I think all of us are leaning forward on that one, Larry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go ahead, skepticism is always a very healthy uh, characteristic to bring to the bench without regard to what the issue is. And uh, that form of skepticism would certainly be one that you would expect. But I don't think you'd have to think too hard. No to drill down into what I think is essentially the problem here that you're driving at. Yeah, can I, we're in classrooms, so I get to do this show of hands. How many of you remember when there were basically three networks? <laughs> do we honestly think 30 years ago that if CBS and NBC had tried to merge, even though they are zero price, that a judge wouldn't have been able to understand the consequences of that merger? I mean, of course they would have. I, the general counsel of um, NBC, who I used to do work for, um, would basically yell or slap the hand of anybody who talked about free TV. Free <laughs> is not a business model, he would say. And he's exactly right. We certainly understood it was ad supported. It was eyeballs. We had no trouble understanding that there was competition among networks 30 years ago. So I don't think this is a new concept at all. No, and I think it's a rat hole, to be perfectly honest. Um, and I'm looking at Susan Creighton, because I can remember when I met her in 1997, and we were debating the fact that, it, that Microsoft was charging zero for its browser, right? So this, we've been there, done that, I think. Um, and, and so uh, the discussion on the previous panel about the consumer welfare standard, and, and the only thing, I, I don't know if it was Steve Salover who said the only thing we could measure is price, so we've been focused on price. I don't think that's true either. I think we've been looking at all aspects of consumer welfare in terms of innovation, in terms of quality. They're, they are hard to measure, but at the same time, the, the full components of consumer welfare, I think, have been looked at and can be looked at uh, under the current standards. And a zero price, to quote the judge, isn't really necessary at zero price. Right. All right. Um, o Ohio v. Amex has come up a number of times. Paul brought it up uh, uh, earlier. Um, Two-sided two -sided markets. To what extent should two-sided markets enter merger analysis? And please understand, I'm not a lawyer. I would never practice law without a license. But gee, the way I read Section 7 of the Clayton Act, where the language says, in any line of commerce, in any section of the country, I think I'm paraphrasing correctly, uh, so how do we reconcile the two-sided market issue with the language of uh, Clayton uh, Section 7? Anybody? OK, John? Sure, I'll take a crack. Um, I think that a lot of what we're talking about today uh, are really attention markets, right? So if we're talking a lot about Google search, we're talking a lot about Facebook, um, these are attention markets. I would argue that they are not actually two-sided platforms at all, although they are often talked about that way. Um, what makes something a two-sided platform as opposed to just a traditional top-down vertical distribution chain of the type that we're all very, very familiar with? Um, I think it's that in a top-down vertical distribution chain, you can trace the asset, the relevant asset, whatever that is, all the way through the chain, right? So wheat is produced by the farmer, the wheat is then sold to an elevator, the wheat is then uh, transported to a miller where it's turned into a different product. So I can trace that product all the way down from producer to consumer. That's not a two-sided market. You can do that with attention markets. You just have to kind of move people around from where you might expect to put them. So you have to put us at the top. We're the producers. We actually produce attention. We trade it, we sell it, really, to Facebook and Google. 
uh, and other attention intermediaries, attention merchants, I see Tim in the room. Um, and then they sell it to the ultimate consumer, the advertisers. You can just treat this like a traditional top-down market. You don't have to get into the Amex mess at all with most of these. Very else? Clays? Uh, have Europeans thought about uh, the sort of merger two-sided issue? Well, those are two, two oh, very oh, good sorry. opinions. Uh, the, the majority and the prior dissent are two very good uh, opinions, and they pose the issue quite clearly. But what I think um, comes across to me as much as anything else is in a lot of these areas we're in sort of a phase change uh, state. Um, after all, when you go from uh, water to ice, uh, it's a phase change. And the characteristics of those are different. And it's awfully hard for amateur uh, economists who happen to wear a black robe to decide uh, issues affecting um, matters of that kind. It's hard for regulators to see far enough into the future to know exactly what the consequences are going to be when the phase changes to a different kind of dimension. Um, but ultimately, what we fall back on is some advice that was given at a, a training session by the Federal Judicial Center when I became a judge. Gerhard Gazelle, who was a very well-known and very able judge in the District of Columbia, said, you know, when the evidence is presented to you and the arguments are presented to you and you don't know what to do, but you've thought about it, you just have to do something that is reasonably arbitrary. <laughs> <laughs> and ultimately, but that's not what we capricious, fall back. But not, not capricious, but not capricious. Just reasonably arbitrary. <laughs> anybody, anybody else? No, I think yeah, maybe please. just one, uh, one observation, because I think uh, without at all being an expert in, in that judgment, uh, I think that the debate we've had about making sure that we don't get into the trap of letting the market definition exercise run the rest of the show is, uh, is super important also in, yep. in, in this context. And we've had a, a case uh, in, this, in the same sector, we've had a number of uh, antitrust enforcements uh, with, with credit cards, and we had one case that went uh, to the court and then was reversed on appeal from the European Court of Justice in uh, Coupon Carte Bancaire, which was about a French uh, credit card uh, system. And the thing that the, 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 uh, the Court of Justice uh, annulled the previous judgment on was exactly that the, the first instance had fallen into the trap of making the market definition being the straitjacket of its analysis. Because what, what ha was happening in that case was that the, uh, the credit card uh, company was saying, hey, I need to charge fees on one side in order to make the system work by benefiting people on, uh, on the other side. I need to use it to, to finance uh, ATM machines. And in that case, the markets had been defined as separate on each side of the market. And the court had, the, f the first court had said, uh, we are not going to look into your argument because we are only looking at one market. We will not take into account what happens on the other side of the market because the markets have been defined on, uh, on each side. And the, uh, the, the Court of Justice says that's not, that's not kosher. You need to make sure that even if you define the markets on each side, you need to make sure that you take into account all the effects on all the markets before you make up uh, your mind. So in that sense, after all the back and forth, what came out was, I think, a very fair and balanced way of saying that even if you, regardless of what you do in terms of market definition, ideally it should help you to, to make a, a sounder analysis, but you should never use it as a straitjacket to avoid looking into what are really the important effects. Okay. Yeah, and I think the only thing I might add is, you know, obviously, stating the obvious, the MX case was a Section 1 case, right? And so in, in dominance and conduct cases, I can see folks trying to look at that case and trying to use it on all sides of the equation because, in my view, a humble opinion, uh, you know, Justice Thomas's majority opinion is a little bit of a mixed bag, right? Because you're, you, know, it, you could say it's really specific to credit card marketplaces, and just stop there because he does find this exception for newspapers and in an advertising space, right? So you could say, okay, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you're talking about advertising or something similar to newspapers, this holding doesn't doesn't you know 
doesn't work. Um, and so I, I do think there's a, a little bit of a mixed bag in terms of how he looked at the relevant market. He also said that only two-sided market, you know, people participating in a two-sided market compete against others in a two-sided market. So it, it has something for everyone uh, to some extent. Um, and so I think as we watch these cases come through the lower courts, uh, and the lower courts really have to go to town understanding this and applying it to their specific facts, I think that's when we're going to see more emerge. I don't think it impacts merger analysis as much, right? Because I think on the merger side, we do have you know, a, a set standard there of substantially lessening competition. And whether something is a two-sided or market, two-sided market or not, I, I don't think impacts that section, you know, Clayton 7 standard. I think in the conduct side, I think that's where you're going to see this evolve. Um, and I, like I said, I think there's something for everyone in that, that opinion to some extent, along with the dissent. All right. Uh, killer acquisitions. It's in the title of the panel. Debbie brought it up. Um, is this just a after the fact 2020 hindsight kind of issue? Uh, you know, the pharmaceutical uh, company that buys a rival that, uh, and then kills the R&D that might have uh, generated a, a substitute. I mean, is that any different from company A buys company B and then decides uh, it's not worth offering the company B brand anymore? Uh, in discount brokerage, uh, where we've seen some action recently, there might be that kind of outcome. Is that a killer acquisition? Uh, how, how should we think about these things? Yeah, you have to pay attention to whether or not it actually harms competition rather than eliminates a, a product. My husband jokes about a, a, a merger that eliminated his favorite brand of ice cream. There you um, go. Does there that go. make it anti-competitive? And he's an antitrust lawyer. Um, does that make it anti-competitive? No. I mean, it's like, you know, did the plant merger eliminate my favorite um, color of, of blue paint? It's only a problem if there wasn't somebody else who could compete to uh, basically bring that blue paint to market or bring that ice cream uh, to market. So I don't think you can simply say, and this is why I think it's a little dangerous, sometimes I hear people say, well, it eliminated consumer choice. Well, every decision a CEO makes in a company eliminates consumer choice. Do I bring this product to market? Do I bring that product to market? If I decide that I don't want to continue in this line of business um, because I don't think that it's profitable, you know, is that a business decision that can't be made, including one that can't be made after a merger if it didn't eliminate competition, but simply basically substituted one CEO's judgment for another CEO's judgment? I think you have to think really carefully about those because then you get into a no merger could ever be done because it might risk eliminating something that somebody cared about. You have to ask the question, is did it eliminate competition between the companies and in such a way that it actually harmed the competitive process, not an individual consumer? Anybody else? John? Sure. I, I guess I would just throw out that I, th I think I appreciate Debbie's comments. I, I think, though, it's also not that hard to spot one of these things when they're about to happen. <laughs> um, and a good example that just got announced recently would be uh, Intuit Credit Karma. So I don't know if anybody's looked at that one yet. But you've got Intuit, the maker of, of TurboTax, which has something like a 67% market share in a well-defined antitrust-relevant market, we know that, um, buying up Credit Karma, which has just started offering a free, not really free, but a free digital do-it-yourself tax product that competes. Uh, it's just been launched a year or two ago. It's starting to gain traction. It's still very small. But you've got Intuit with a long history of, of trying to stifle the race to free, they call it. Why are they buying Credit Karma? You know, I'll let a judge decide, but... <laughs> got one on Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think it's that hard to see what's coming in a case like that. Yeah, and I, just to echo what I started with, I think there's been experimentation in this area already, whether we call it killer acquisitions or nascent competition or potential competition as well. And I think we've seen, you know, mixed results on that. So, you know, we actually just go to pragmatic you know, if the agencies start challenging mergers, I saw a statistic that the FTC has now challenged more mergers in this year, already in this year, than it has in the previous past year. So they are clearly out there on the on the playing field and in, 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 with real intensity. Um, and, and I think we'll we'll see. We still have the courts, right? We still have judges, just like you know Judge Walker, looking at these matters and coming up with opinions that 
you know, either this isn't a likely entrant into the marketplace, and so, you know, we're not going to hold the merger to be anti-competitive, or the parties abandon it, you know, and, and so we, 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 there's more to come on this, I think, as we watch this evolve even further, and we think about it in the tech space, and we think about um, how do you take that, you, you can't just we can't just say it's anti-competitive, right? We have to go before federal courts, I guess is my point. And, and what's happened so far has been a little bit of a mixed bag. It doesn't mean that the agencies won't keep trying and shouldn't, and shouldn't even look back you know, retrospectively, right? The FTC is doing that now with their 6B uh, order that they just put out, and they're looking at all acquisitions for the last 10 years of five companies um, you know, that are below the HSR thresholds. And, and they can bring actions if they want to based on what they find there. So uh, stay tuned to this space is what I would say, Larry, as, as I think we're going to see it uh, evolve and emerge, and we're going to see the thinking evolve and emerge. But if the FTC wants to challenge the cases, they're going to have to go before the Judge Walkers and, and others like him, and possibly even more conservative judges. Uh, who, who, not more conservative <laughs> 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 Whoa! Sorry! <laughs> Well, with that, like, wherever you are on the spectrum, somewhere on the other side of it, um, you know, that, that are, are going to grapple with these issues, and I think we might not see them stopped. And so I don't know what else we do in our jurisprudence and, and in our system other than what we, you know, we have in place now. Unless well, more conservative yeah. judges may not be hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, but, just, but just one sentence on that, in fairness, because I guess I'm less of the view that one's political um, um, leanings uh, affect how you view witness credibility. The judge in the Steris decision was a Democratic appointed former antitrust division judge who we went before. So we thought, okay, this is at least a, a decent fair draw, but at the end of the day, he had to evaluate the evidence of whether it was more likely than not, which was the standard, and he accepted the standard, and we didn't argue about the standard at all. He just accepted more likely than not 51% whether the company would have entered the market, and based on all the evidence, concluded that it was not. Now, we can change the Section 7 standard, and maybe that's what people want to do, but right now, based on that standard, those cases are very hard to win. Chris? Yeah, maybe just uh, a, f a few comments. I think. I, I, I very much agree that that is important to be precise about the the um, what what you mean when you talk about killer acquisitions and your and your definitions. Uh, and I think there is definitely it's very important to distinguish between the the pharmaceutical evidence that we have seen starting to pop up uh, and whether or not we should do something about that. And then the the digital space because it's obvious that Facebook of Instagram is still there and WhatsApp is still there. there. I think your, your case with Oracle and PeopleSoft was the last real killer acquisition <laughs> that we had on the books because Larry Ellison back then was very explicit that he wanted to discontinue uh, discontinue PeopleSoft. Uh, so so we need. I think we need to, to every time dig through the evidence and see exactly what what is it that is driving uh, the, the deal, and we have to live with the fact that very often the companies themselves are not really sure about what mm. is driving uh, the deal. We don't know what will happen with uh, with these vertically or, or conglomerate related uh, markets uh, in the future. And yet, it's incumbent on us still to decide whether we we clear or uh, or, or prohibit the cases in in our in our jurisdiction because we have to justify uh, either way. Well, and that's what's going on, right? Because the Google Looker transaction, that was mm. cleared, right? We have Google Fitbit now pending, and then we've seen a lot of uproar around health data, et cetera. So that's why I keep, to my, in my view, this is, we are in real time now evolving, and it's hard to predict, I think, based on what we've seen so far. But what we've seen so far is a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, and, and, and we'll see the appetite of the agencies today you know, and how they face transactions that are killer acquisitions or nascent competitors and, um, and, and again, they, they just did it with, with Edgewell Harry's and it succeeded. It, that merger was abandoned um, and it wasn't even the biggest player in the market. You know, it was buying a small share. So we are seeing that in real time right now in the deals that the agencies in the U.S. are blocking. But this is a dynamic system and things change and there are shocks to the system all the time. And so we're not going to enter a phase, I think, in which things are settled and everybody's going to know what right. the rules are. Right. 
Uh, it's inevitably going to be changing all the time, mm -hmm. and we simply have to live with that consequence. Right. One more from me, and then we'll go to uh, Q&A more generally. Uh, one click away. Uh, since at least the middle 1990s. Dan, you had to deal with one click away when you were dealing with Microsoft. Now, of course, that was a Section 2 case, but still. One click away. How, how should we be thinking about such assertions? We've heard it all, at the, all you know, for 25 years. How should we be thinking about this? Really? Uh, you want me to go? Yeah, sure. Debbie, he would have sure. talked a lot. Sure. So. No, no. Well, so, so I assume what you mean by one click away, Larry, just so we're all on the same time, is an attempt to remind, especially the antitrust authorities, that you know, you're unable to lock in consumers because they'll just go someplace else, right? And yet, I will remind us all that we really haven't, we, we've seen a lot of innovation, but these platforms have grown and been sustained. We don't have any new platforms seemingly emerging than the ones we have today. And, and um, I, I think that what we do have is this accumulation of data by particularly one party, and I just name it, Google, which I think has greatly inhibited others from being able to compete. Um, and it may not, it may be that people can click away, but it's even harder to click away and harder to, you know, in the advertising space to do anything because of the, you know, we talked about Chrome. Chrome has a 65% share now, right? You know, so it is extremely large and robust, and maybe it's because it's a better mousetrap. Um, but with all the other, between Waze and YouTube and the other ways that Google's collecting data and accumulating it, that's a power that they have. There's just no question about it. And so what they do with that power matters. And so I think that's what the agencies must be looking at today is to see what happens there. So one click away when you control that much of a marketplace and data to me really is, again, a little bit of a rat hole or a red herring. Okay. Any? John? Yeah, I would uh, absolutely echo that. I, I like that term, rat hole. I might start, uh, <laughs> start stealing that. Um, but yeah, I've always thought of this as just really kind of misleading or sort of misdirecting us as sort of antitrust analysts. You know, first off, it's a claim about switching costs, right? It's saying the, the switching costs are really low in digital markets. You know, first off, I think that's just sort of descriptively inaccurate as to a lot of these things. Is it really that easy to switch between, say, Instagram and Twitter, where they're highly differentiated, if by nothing else than their user base, which we had a question about earlier, right? It's, you know, if my friends are on Twitter, I might be able to click to a different social network, but that's not a reasonable substitute to me, right? And that's the question we should be focusing on. Um, and then kind of the second point to be made is that switching costs have never been and shouldn't be, I don't think, outcome determinative in antitrust analysis. And I like to use the example of toothpaste. For what product could there be lower switching costs than toothpaste? Right? It's literally the question of whether I reach for the Crest or the Colgate, and they're two inches apart on a shelf. Talk about low switching costs, right? But if you combine those two companies, they would have something like a 65 to 70 percent share of the US toothpaste market. I don't think the low switching costs mean that regulators shouldn't take a look at that deal. So switching costs just isn't really the right question to be asking. We're supposed to be asking about reasonably interchangeable substitutes, I think. Anybody else? All right, so uh, we're gonna now go to audience Q&A. Um, anybody have a question, please A, identify yourself, and B, keep it short and keep it as a question. <laughs> yeah, all right, yes, uh, identify yourself, Nick. <laughs> yeah, that's how <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the question is as follows. Um, uh, digital platforms such as uh, Google and Facebook um, have been able to act as monopsonists in the market for um, information, the market for personal information, leveraging their market power uh, in whatever they do first.
I'm glad you brought up vertical vertical mergers. We, if if we have time at the end, we may want to come back to vertical mergers, so the guidelines, etc. But John, um, I guess I could take a crack at it, uh, but hopefully people will be able to clean up my mess. Uh, I would I would urge us to stop focusing so much on data in these markets. I think you mentioned Google and Facebook in particular. Um, why do they want our data, right? Why does, say, an advertiser want our data? They really don't. They don't just want to sit there in their sort of high tower and like cackle about knowing that, that I have slid into the DMs of an ex-girlfriend, right? Like, why would they want to know that? <laughs> what do they want to do? What's the... Your wife <laughs> goodness. <laughs> do not tell Let's her. Let's not go much further than say, that. Wow. Particular <laughs> wow. Who knew we were going there? <laughs> What is their business model? It's not accumulating data about the John Newmans of the world. Um, it's really about gathering attention, right? They really want to capture eyeballs so that they can sell them to advertisers, which again, are the consumers in the market. So I think data in a very is, effective way, in a very focused. Uh, uh, they do want to narrowly slice it, right? I just want to buy the slice that I want. I don't want everybody's attention. But yeah, uh, so I think focusing on data is it's really just the sort of derived demand product. It's not the core of the action. I like to liken it to if you were back in the late 1990s, focusing on the demand for mouse pads because PC demand had taken off. That, that's just kind of missing the boat. Mm. Any, anybody else? I, I don't know if I agree with that. I think the data is the key. Uh, and and I, I think that data accumulates profiles on all of us that are sold to advertisers. So I, I, I do think that, that is, there's a power in the data that's being accumulated. Uh, I think you have to think but about is it. But is that an antitrust problem? Yeah. I agree. That's a, a, good, uh, I that's a good question. I think there's a serious question whether it may be another yes. genus of problem. And yeah. I think it's awfully broad. It's, it's, it's sort of like, is, is a online shopping a market? Is data a market? I mean, I think you have to really ask the question of what's the you know, data that's being accumulated? Are there other sources of that data? Is it being used in any competitive manner in a vertical transaction? Is there actually an ability to foreclose or is there the availability of data elsewhere? I mean, I can't say it enough times as somebody who had to look at you know, hundreds of cases when I was uh, an enforcer, the facts really matter. You can't just place these broad brushes uh, and say that you know, two companies have data and therefore that merger is, is a problem. It's, I just think that is just not a way to go. Okay, another cue from, yeah, Over here. identify uh, yourself. I, my name is uh, Tim Wu, I teach antitrust at Columbia University. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, get back to your serial acquisitions question. Uh, first of all, thanks for, for this panel. Uh, a distinguished professor here at NYU, Scott Hemphill, uh, has been uh, putting forth a theory that really, and this was mentioned, that uh, the Section 2 is, is a good way to think about serial acquisition problems. I, uh, say good things about him because he's also my co-author. And uh, <laughs> if that's right, isn't the right way to think, you know, if you think about the Section 2 frame, isn't this sort of but-for analysis kind of the wrong way of thinking about it? Shouldn't we be thinking in line with Microsoft about the use of uh, mergers to insulate the uh, monopolist from, from competitive forces and, and, and maintain their monopoly? Which seems to be a completely different kind of question as to whether Instagram had 11 people at it or not, or, or that kind of question. And uh, on that Instagram, I think Twitter was trying to get Instagram anyway, so they, who knows what that would have been. But just sticking with that, that, that should be a completely different framework. And I have a specific question for Debbie Feinstein. I, I think I heard, if I wasn't mistaken, that you said that um, uh, even three to two or two to one mergers, we need to sort of analyze those on a case-by-case -case basis and balance. Now, I may be old-fashioned, but I learned in law school about structural presumptions and Wait, wait, wait. Okay. okay. What I, yeah, let me respond to the. I want to respond to both of those, um, but let me take the first. What I said is two to one or three to two, when you're talking about general concepts of innovation, we don't know whether or not two companies that are innovating in a broad space. We don't know whether or not collaboration or competition is better in that. I don't want to be heard that you know mergers to monopoly or three to two when you're talking about specific products. I don't think you have structural presumptions when you can't define a market. You know, we have people sometimes just say, well, they're innovating in the technology space. I mean, that's not a well-defined market. And what I'm saying is in those sorts of cases, we don't know whether or not at that broad level of, of innovation there's a difference. So, so that's, that's point one. On the Section 2 case, yeah, I mean, I think that's the um, FTC 
um, when I was there, brought the case against um, QuestCorp for um, acquiring uh, an entity that was basically the only possibility that it was a threat. And I don't think that the commission thought, they wrote a blog post on that, whether they could have proved that it was more likely than not that another company would have acquired that. Uh, and again, it was, a, it was a, that the but-for world wasn't, it was a standalone. The but-for world was another company would have acquired it um, and made a difference. And the commission brought it under section two and must have been fairly convinced. And they got $100 million in disgorgement um, uh, from the company uh, because we, you know, we thought we had a pretty good case on that. So I think section two can be used. And I think in that case, the standard is um, likely to be less than is it likely that it would have entered? The commission has at least taken the position that it doesn't need to show likelihood in that case. So they're not afraid to take that position on a Section 2 case. I think the other thing that will be interesting in the cases that are going through the agencies right now, the Google, the Facebook, you know, Apple, et cetera, because we know it's pretty public those are all ongoing, is how predatory intent factors into that You know, when we look at this, right? And and are we going to find, I can remember sitting in the opening arguments in Microsoft and you know David Boyd is putting email after email about the predatory intent of Microsoft. And to your point, Judge Mon, I think that was extraordinarily impactful in the courtroom and in the district court's opinion. But then we saw the course of conduct come back and haunt, right? And say, you know, in the Court of Appeals decision. So they're hard cases to bring. Doesn't mean you shouldn't bring them. They're hard cases to bring. And, and I'm, I'm thinking that given some of the folks' names who were, you know, thrown out in some of our earlier panels, they seem to be very actively involved in their companies and writing documents. And I think we'll see what, what that cache of documents discloses. And I think that'll be very, uh, insightful. Will it be dispositive? No, but I do think predatory intent is one element of the full picture to, to Judge Vaughn's point uh, about how, how these cases can proceed. Follow the facts. Follow the facts, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, Steve. Uh, Steve. All right, Steve, uh, identify uh, yourself. Steve, Steve how, so the uh, case you're talking about, Professor Wu raised, is a relatively simple case, I think. Acquisition of the only Make sure it's a question, Steve. <laughs> Make sure it's a question. <laughs> so the question is, what do you do with the acquisition um, where there doesn't appear to be a competitive problem at the time? The acquiring company uses the product, transforms the product, um, combines it with other technology, so that it does, uh, you know, increase the value of their own product and increase the market share. Is that something the agency should look at after the fact and do something about, or not? That's the question. Okay, and the question I'm going to ask is what's the harm to competition or if customers benefited from it in a way they wouldn't have absent the merger? That's ultimately the question the antitrust authorities are trying to, to answer. And on the facts as you laid them out, I don't know the answer to that question one way or another without learning a whole lot more. Anybody else? All right. Any other questions? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Andy, come on. For completeness, you've got to identify yourself. Hi, Andy Gavin. Okay. Um, I wanted to follow up on uh, something that Shara said about the FTC 6B. Um, is it possible that one consequence of that 6B, looking back at these past acquisitions, will be to rethink the Hart Scott Rodino pre merchant yes, notification? Um, might it be informative on what we can think as nation competition and innovation competition? And could that really change our use of dollar thresholds, for example, in identifying what kinds of mergers uh, would have to be pre-notified? Yeah, I, that, that they've stated that, Andy, and the purpose in the study. You know, when you read the public statements that the FTC put out with their initiation of the 6B orders, that that was why they were doing this. You know, they, they have these special powers at the FTC. I don't think it's a coincidence that they're exercising them at the same time as senators introducing a bill to. Uh, rearrange them. Uh, so, uh, but at the same time, I take it at, the fa at their face value that they are looking to see, you know, I've had clients say 90 million? Why, if it's 91 million, then I don't have to, I mean, it's like they have, we have a whole body of um, informal interpretation surrounding the Hart Scott Rodino Act. Um, and it's sad to see that go by the wayside because we've all lived and breathed by it and it gives business a lot of certainty. On the other hand, 
I think if we are going to look holistically, which I think the FTC is trying to do at the Hart Scott Rodino Act and see if it's capturing those uh, acquisitions that do potentially cause harm, you know, it, it's another stay tuned. Yeah, I think it'll always be some bright dollar threshold because otherwise it's, you know, impossible. You can't have people sort of, I mean, I just think the market share thresholds that Europe uses make my hair stand on end because it's very hard. You have to define the market to figure out whether you even have to report and then argue with the government about how to define the market doesn't strike me as the easiest way to go. But the commission um, already took a step towards this years ago when they basically changed the size of person tests to say that we're not going to pay too much attention to the size of the target if the acquisition <coughs> price is a certain size. In other words, we're, we're going to presume that that target means a little more than it's $10 million in revenues might otherwise suggest if somebody's paying a billion dollars for them. And so the notion that they might say that if the acquisition price is X or the, um, uh, uh, the size of the acquiring company is Y, that we don't have a $90 million threshold, um, you know, might be a way they go. They will capture additional transactions that don't need to be notified, but that's a, a balance that the hard scout rules always have to make. And they'll just try to figure out whether they've aired one side or the other side. All right. Um, the v vertical issue uh, didn't come up. Nick briefly raised it, but let me raise it again. Uh, the Contrary to Bill Kovacic's uh, earlier comment, the Department of Justice and FTC have managed to come together at least on proposing a set of uh, vertical merger guidelines. Uh, they're out for, con I th maybe the comment period ended day before yesterday, but they've been out for comment. Anybody on the panel have any thoughts about the proposed uh, vertical merger guidelines? Anybody looked at them? Have some I've thoughts? commented. Right. So anyway. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, I have, our, our law firm filed comments as well and had a lot of clients uh, you know, making comments. And I have to sort of self-disclose, I was on the panel, I think, with uh, Steve Salop and others talking about whether they should update the, the vertical guidelines. And my own view is they at least had to withdraw all the old guidelines because they clearly did not represent the agency's views on vertical guidelines and were cited by Judge Leon in the AT&T Time Warner matter. So that was just, you know, it have to be done. And, and advocated for some sort of a policy statement. So now they've done that. And, and, you know, it's a bit of a missed opportunity to some extent. I know these are hard to negotiate uh, between the agencies, et cetera, but I think without more clarity around the economics, I think that that's hard. And then I think, you know, if it was possible to sort of somehow have the European, you know, looking at Kleist, uh, you know, and the U.S. standards for what is either a soft safe harbor or not a safe harbor, whatever we're going to call it, of 20% versus 30% um, would have been helpful at least to have some dialogue around that. Anybody else? Yeah, I would just say, look, I, I think they basically say what the agencies have been doing now for 10 or 15 years. I didn't see anything particularly new in those. I think if you read a number of the complaints going back a good 10, 15 years now, you look at um, Pepsi's acquisition of its bottlers and Coke's acquisition of its bottlers, and you read the complaint, complaint and the analysis there. You read about GE's acquisition of Avio and the complaint there. So, so just on Pepsi and the bottlers and, and Coke and its bottlers, the concern where there was whether there were adequate firewalls because Pepsi also uh, and Coke also um, uh, distributed Dr. Pepper. And the concern was whether or not as a result of this um, parent Pepsi whose bottlers were distributing Dr. Pepper would get advance notice. And the firewalls were put up and everybody always says, but do we know if it worked? It's like, I gotta think Dr. Pepper would complain if it felt like every time it was about to initiate something new, it got beat to the marketplace by Coke or, or, or Pepsi, so there's somebody with a real incentive to know what's going on and complain. And you read you know, a complaint like GE Avio, which is a question GE bought, um, uh, um, Avio, which also um, sold parts to Pratt & Whitney to make engines, GE and Pratt & Whitney compete in engines, and the concern was whether or not um, they were going to be able to uh, foreclose, delay, slow down, oops, the shipment got lost, sorry, we didn't get you the parts to make your engine competing against us, uh, and the commission had a series of um, 
uh, requirements in the consent decree that were that really bolstered an existing commercial agreement between GE and Pratt and Whitney uh, to basically remedy those issues. So I think if you le read those complaints, there's nothing in those complaints that really isn't covered in the the guidance and vice versa. So I don't think there's anything new. And I think if you look, there have been a lot of vertical enforcement actions. It's just that most of them get addressed by consent or by commercial issues, and so I don't, you know, I just think you have to look at that context. I, I used to complain when I was at the F FTC that reporters only thought I was doing my job if we actually had a case that went to court and got litigated. They never paid attention to the consents, and they never paid attention to the um, transactions that were abandoned because they don't make the, new the news, but I think when you look at the body of enforcement that the agencies do, you have to look at all of those things uh, and ask the question of, you know, are they looking at the right things? Is it enough? Did the remedies work, not just the ones that get litigated in the courtroom. All right, I'm going to end this session with a question, and I will also provide the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the question, what happens when conference organizers invite five smart, <laughs> articulate people to provide a discussion and comments on merger issues, and the answer is magic. Thank you. Please join me in thanking you.